I invite you to remain standing as we read the Gospel of Matthew. You could turn to that in your Bible if you, you would like. It's Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All of the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked, and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison, and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, Depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Back in the day when golf was relatively unknown in the United States, gentleman went on vacation to Scotland where he was introduced to the sport, fell in love with it. And so on his journey back to the United States, he had purchased clubs in Scotland and golf balls and brought them back, set up uh, a one-hole course on his own property and invited one of his friends over to experience the pleasures of golf. And so when his friend came over, he showed him his golf clubs and the golf ball, and he dropped the golf ball on the ground, and he took a big swing at the golf ball, and up flew grass and dirt everywhere, and when you look back down, the golf ball was still there. Well, not to be dismayed, he, he had another try at it, and again, more dirt this time because some of the grass had already been <laughs> taken away, and so it was kind of a cloud of dust around him, and still the golf ball stood there. Six swings later, ball still laying on the ground, his friend looks at him and says, you know, I see that this is, has a vigorous exercising component, but I'm lost on the purpose of the ball. Well, as we continue our uh, thrust into uh, our field guide for Hashtag for Families, this week we are focusing on mission 
but I don't want us to get lost in a flurry of activities that you may want to sign up for, but miss the point and purpose of what we're about. Missing the purpose and the point that we are about. Today we are talking and focusing on mission, but as you look at worship, discipleship, mission, and next week we will speak to evangelism, these are not necessarily four different components of the faith that you can just work on one or work, or the, work on another. They're integrally involved with one another. One leads to the other. One is involved in the next. One cannot just so simply separate one of these ideas out of our life and just focus on one. Meaning that if you look at this and say, oh, well, you know, I got the first one covered, and so I feel good about that, be at peace, but yet there are other components of the faith that is just as important to develop you as a whole. And as we hear in the gospel lesson for us today, the outcome of our faith is ultimately important. It creates within us a nature towards living life that becomes so instinctual, so habit-forming, that we don't even realize we're doing it as we're living it out. So as we start to focus on mission today, I'm reminded you that you don't have to go home and sit down with your children and and your family and sit at the table and do some brainstorming about what should be the mission statement of our family. What is our purpose, our goal? No more than really we have to settle down as a church and come up with a mission for us. For we have been given a mission by Christ. As one theologian put it, the church doesn't have a mission as much as the mission has a church. And that mission that Christ has given to all of us, we find it also in the Gospel of Matthew, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Now, our church has kind of reduced that down to a real easy, memorable phrase, uh, to know Christ and to See, we already got that integrated into the, to our understanding of who our mission is. And that mission is also extended to you and to your family. This is not just something that the administrative board or the, the leadership team in the life of the church tries to execute. It is all of us living out our Christian faith together that, that makes this mission whole and lived out to bring forth the vision that God has for our church to reach out to transform lives by extending God's love to all. That is the naturally living out of this mission is in the area that we call Carrieville. So for you and for me, as we try to, to live this out, what are some of the components that we need to pay, pay special attention attention to. Well, that was really a part of one of the missionary teams in the life of the church that was trying to figure out how they could continue living this out in their life. They were thinking how they might be able to best make disciples. How could they extend God's love into their community? And they were thinking about maybe some of the mass mailings that they might be able to do, some Facebook posts that might be important to help people put a like or to put a share that would uh, extend it out into the community. They, on their team, had invited a lady uh, who had uh, moved to their community from Africa. She was uh, a Christian in Africa, uh, was converted by one of their church's missionary efforts in that area. And so when she moved to the United States, she became a part of this faith community that helped really sponsor her and give her her life eternal through sharing the gospel in her community. 
they asked her, what do y'all do in your community? How, how do you share the faith? How, how do you become missionaries in your midst? And she said, well, we, we don't send out flyers and we don't do Facebook posts. And so I'm not sure of all the strategy that, you know, you've been talking about. But what we do is, is that we'll send one or two families to live in a village. And that the villagers see how they live and they want to become a Christian too. And so almost one by one around the community says, well, you know, we're not going to be moving our members around into different communities. And she said, but don't you live in a community now? You know, that is sometimes lost on you and me. When we think about mission work, we think sometimes it's something that somebody else does somewhere else. Not necessarily what we do right here and now. It is something that we might help fund rather than something that we might do. There's some great insight into the gospel lesson this morning that reminds that we all have an individual responsibility to be so claimed by the gospel that our behaviors live out the natural teachings of Christ, whether we know it or not. But, but we very rarely, do we, think of the very neighborhood that we have moved into or have lived in so long that we see ourselves as God's missionary that God has placed particularly in that area to show forth what a Christian family looks like. Nine times out of ten, probably we think of ourselves, is that it is everybody's own responsibility to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That you really don't have a relationship or a part in that. It may be that you felt blessed because you were raised in a Christian home or, or that you had Christian friends or you came to knowledge at a church during a revival or, or some type of missional uh, advance in that area. Not so much about the people who live around you. But here in the gospel lesson today, Jesus says that, that we can be known by our behavior. And wouldn't it be interesting, what is the, the community's understanding of who we are by the way they experience us? Do they see us as generous people who make sure that the thirsty are watered, the, the hungry are fed, the naked are clothed, the sick and in prison are, are visited? And that doesn't mean that you have to wear everything you do in a banner on your shirt or in every conversation you talk about all the things that you do for the Lord. But I guarantee you that if your neighbor across the street has a child who's been sick, and especially have gone to the hospital and, and you've come over and offered a casserole or, or told them that you're praying for them, is there anything that you can do? If you notice that your neighbor's lawn has not been mowed and you know that they typically mow it themselves, that there might be something going on in their life, and you can say, how's it going? Can I be helpful? Can I be the one who, who helps mow your lawn this week? Love to do that for you. Are, are, are you the, the one that they know that, that you are truly interested on their behalf? Because the Scripture says that that though those on the right, that he, it, it, they didn't say that, that you cured world hunger. It just said that you fed somebody who was hungry. Which means it's broken down to the individual level. And from a family perspective, you can start to see, God, why have you placed me in this neighborhood? Why have you placed me in this community? community what difference 
is this community going to be like because we live here on your behalf? These are sometimes conversations that we really never have with ourselves. We never really think it through at that level. We're, we're thinking that, well, the reason why we live here is, is that it's close to work. Or if it's not close to work, it's a good school system. Or it's a safe place to live. It's a good investment. We may have tons of reasons why we have chosen the house and the community in which we live, but may not have thought it through at our most deepest and needful level about how it relates to our relationship with God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So as we think through mission together, I want you to know that we all have the same mission, but we will all live it out just a little bit differently because each one of us has different skill sets, different capacities different abilities to make a difference in this community, in this world in which we live. The other thing I want you to know is that as you reach out in mission and in ministry, as you try to, to find a way to involve yourself in the life of the church, maybe even as much as becoming a mentor for one of our confirmands who will make a profession of faith next year in May, I want you to know that it's not always, uh, you know, sunshine and roses. Uh, has anybody ever heard this phrase, no good deed goes? Boy, y'all have heard that too. Well, I, I want you to know that that, that's not, that saying is not out there because it never happens. It is quite interesting sometimes how when we try to, to extend the, the cup of cold water or when we try to carry over and feed the hungry or visit someone or we are involved in some uh, missionary relief effort, that things don't always go right and, and in actuality sometimes we come away harmed, hurt, discouraged. I've been on a few mission trips where I've had somebody break an arm or twist an ankle. I, had, I was on one particular mission trip where a gentleman had purchased a truck uh, just for uh, being a part of this mission effort. Now, I guess that was the excuse he gave his wife for purchasing that, that it would be really good on the mission. But the mission field that we took it on, or him with, I think he ended up with a flat tire and I know a tree limb through the radiator. And I don't know if any of you ever tried to repair a radiator, but in the old days, they could be repaired. Not so much now. So you have to buy a brand new one to go in its place. And so it's kind of interesting having that evening conversation about what went wrong with the truck today. And how sometimes we almost notice it was almost beginning to rob the joy of the reason why we were there in the first place. I mean, we have stories of the past, do we not? Of missionaries who gone into an area to share the good news of Jesus Christ and they have become martyrs. One young man became a missionary into Africa. It was a little bit of his family lineage. His dad was a missionary uh, to Ecuador who became a martyr to the native Indians of that area. He himself did not choose to continue in that area of ministry. He instead went to Africa and wasn't really being re his response wasn't all that good. Actually, he was running into folks who, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, preaching in the street or seen it before, but the hecklers way outnumbered those that were being saved. And sometimes the, the hecklers would get, after the sermon was over with and after the evangelical message was delivered, uh, would sometimes accost them. And he was in this one township where he was spreading the gospel, and 
And again, he wasn't getting a lot of results from it. He was very cast down. There was a, an established church in the community that he just decided to go to, and the pastor lived on the premises, so he was there. And they just sat down and, and had a nice talk. And the pastor there says, you know, when I get down, when I feel like life is not heading in the directions that, that uh, I thought that, that I was supposed to be heading, or, or I'm running into conflict that I didn't anticipate, or the fruit coming from my labors is not as much as I had hoped. You know, I enjoy reading about the testimonies of, of missionaries, especially those that have been martyred for the faith. They remind me that, that I have not yet been required that type of sacrifice for Christ's ministry, and how many others have. He says, have you ever heard of the missionary Nate Saint? Nate Saint, he said, was called to do missionary uh, work in Ecuador. And as he tried to evangelize the Native Americans, the, not the, Native, the, the natives of, that, of Ecuador there, the Native Indians, that they, they killed him. They, they martyred. He says, I feel so blessed that even though I'm trying to reach the people in this community, I haven't had to give that supreme sacrifice. The young man was in tears. He said he never knew that, that anybody knew anything about his father's ministry. He really thought that his father was just one of those blips on the Christian map whose life was lived and died without much meaning. I mean, he was a living testimony to his father's life, but, but he didn't think his father's ministry really added up to anything. Almost could be written off as a failure. And here, almost on the other side of the world, in a little town in Africa, he runs across a local pastor who is being encouraged by the witness of his father's life. You and I never know the impact sometimes that, you, that we will make in the lives of others. You do not know what it means to extend necessarily that cup of cold water in Christ's name. You won't maybe ever find out that the casserole dish that you carried over to feed someone who was hungry, what that meant, or the profound effects of ripples that may occur because of that act of kindness. But the reason why you do it is not to be able to write in your notebook the results of your behavior. Actually, we find out in the gospel today that you live that life so naturally that when the Lord tells you why you're on the sheep side, you go, well, when did we do all those things, Lord? Because you're just as surprised that you're not on the goat side. <laughs> but it was because that you had developed a way of life, that you had worked in the areas of your discipleship that it became a natural component of the way in which you lived. It was also expressed in the neighborhoods that you find yourself living. May all of us live into our mission to, to know Christ and to make him known. May we help together with our concerted efforts to extend to reach out, to transform lives by extending God's love to all. All the difference it will make not only in our community, but just as importantly in your life and in the life of your family. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.